Hello and welcome to Wet Weather Construction. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to record this presentation for later viewing uh, and uh, enjoyable viewing in your uh, free time because I know you're uh, probably really going to want to go back to this. So, so far we only have three or four participants. So rather than wait to the end to uh, uh, ask and answer questions, go ahead and as, as we go, in fact, you can unmute yourself and ask a question anytime um, as I continue with this. So probably we'll get some more folks coming in and I will uh, uh, let them in as they come in. Anyway, so wet weather construction. I'm Dave Jenkins, uh, certified professional version at Sediment Control, president of the Pacific Northwest Chapter IECA. Recently, recently retired after 22 years at the Port of Seattle as the erosion control stormwater engineer, um, actually last January. And I left in the middle of a particular project. Um, after I left, the resident engineer and project manager also left. So I told my boss I'd be glad to come back and help finish it out. So I started this past Tuesday back at the Port of Seattle again as an employee for a couple months. All of my experience it has been in heavy civil transportation related construction. So seaport, airport, and roadway type construction. What do I mean when I say wet weather construction? For at least for Western Washington, uh, that means basically October 1st through March 31st, with the other months being dry or summer months. So uh, it's probably going to it's going to change depending on where you're at, of course. So I've included the web address up here at the top of the location, the Western Region Climate Center, which covers Alaska, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, um, and you can check it out if you haven't already uh, done so and pull up all kinds of charts based on historical record. Lots of reasons for wet work, um, emergency type work. At the uh, SeaTac airport, there's uh, FAA requirements, operational requirements that push norm normally summer work into wet months. Uh, of course, there's large multi-year projects. And then a lot of times there's timing issues. So maybe the design gets finished on time, but permitting an environmental re review process takes longer than uh, anticipated, which might push, push the start of a project into summer. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of the questions here, but these are things that I always think about when uh, starting a project uh, to help decide how we're gonna manage the, the water on a project. So basically, uh, first one is how much water you're going to have to deal with and what are your discharge requirements having to do with how dirty the water is going to be. Um, in, uh, in King County, Seattle area, discharge requirements can be pretty stringent. At the Port of Seattle, they're very stringent. And in particular, at the uh, SeaTac International Airport, the construction discharge requirements are um, rather than benchmarks, which is a state standard, they're actually effluent limits for turbidity. So it's very stringent. Uh, I've seen projects where discharges are to a very dirty, turbid river. So, you know, maybe the risk of having a violation is much lower in that situation. So these kinds of things need to be considered when you're deciding what to do. The two main challenges for wet weather projects are, of course, water quantity and quality. So, um, but ultimately it's all about the water. This is, was one of my favorite beers. I like the light table beers, as this one says. So with water quantity, there's several things that determine how much, of course, area, soil cover, uh, bare soil or uh, vegetated, the amount of rainfall, and then water that's running onto the site I like visual, so I just kind of think think of uh, the roll-off storage tanks uh, in relation to how much water we're going to have on a project. One inch of rain on one acre of area uh, equals just over 27,000 gallons. 
So I'm not talking about runoff, just what's actually falling. And a tank to the brim is about 21,000 gallons. So I figure 1.3, and I, I picture this. So I've got a 10 acre project. Um, you know, I've got 13 to 15 tanks sitting there to contain the water. Not suggesting you want to contain all the water, but just as a visual. And then water quality, I'm primarily talking about sediment and water, so turbidity, which is uh, one of the main measurement standards. Now, some jurisdictions uh, do presentations in Canada and they use total suspended solids as a measure, which unfortunately is a really a lab, a quantitative lab, uh, laboratory measure. Turbidity, I think, is more useful in, in practice for contractors to be able to, do, to use. Um, some people suggest there is a correlation between the two. And what I've found is the correlation is possible in very site specific conditions and soil specific conditions. So it's not an across the board. You can't say uh, this TSS equals this turbidity across the board. So uh, it is possible. Turbidity is a problem uh, in, in specifically, and uh, thanks to water tectonics for putting this chart together. Or if you look on the right, it says silt fence, ponds, vaults, and biosolids. They're good for treating down to fine sand. And I'd push this a little bit lower uh, into the maybe the 60 to 100 micron range. Uh, passive filtration, a little, probably a little bit farther, maybe into the upper silt fraction. And then pressurized uh, sand filtration, bag filters, and such, you collect a little bit smaller particle. Unfortunately, turbidity, uh, pers persistent turbidity is in the clay and colloidal fraction. So the only way to deal with those things is actual active chemical or electrical uh, treatment. An example, another visual here, um, this is runoff from a stockpile and uh, it's draining down, the stockpile on the right there, it's draining down through vegetated ditches into this long narrow stormwater pond and then the draining through the pipe to the left of the picture. And then these are samples that were taken along that route. So the sample on the left is what's coming off the pile. And the sample on the uh, far right is what's draining out of the pond itself. Turbidity, uh, the color of the water column, not that much difference. And both of those uh, turbidity numbers would be higher than allowed discharge. Uh, at the Port of Seattle anyway, but notice the settleable fraction at the bottom, a significant reduction in what in the larger soil particles. So turbidity is very persistent and difficult to deal with. Um, so when you're work, working wet weather projects, that's gonna be one of the main problems you have to manage. Four principles related to wet weather work are try, uh, you try to avert uh, uh, the problem or avert the water, divert water, uh, contain water on site, and then discharge, meaning some kind of treatment, uh, most likely. So avert, uh, the, the best way to avert a problem is to do dirt work in the summer months. So April 1st through September 30th would be the best. Uh, I know that's not possible, but that is, that is the best way. Um, some questions that you can ask, and, and we have done this at the port with success actually during the design process, does this have to be done now? Uh, can this be put off till the next summer? And a lot of times that is the case. Uh, projects can be put off so that they can be done in the dry. Um, on larger projects, okay, we have, it's multi-year, we do have to do it in the winter, the wet months. Uh, can it be done in smaller chunks? So can you clear say 10 to 20 acres instead of 100 acres at once? For example, this project, not a port project, fortunately, it's near my house. Um, two, three years, two years ago, let's see, I think two or three years ago, actually, uh, this developer came in and cleared 80 acres, cleared, grubbed, did the earthwork, and uh, they have yet to build a house. So two to three years later, I uh, drove by there the other day, they, have, they do have the roads, the curbs, drainage and stuff in now, but um, it was shut down. They, they hammered a wetland and caused people and neighbors to have to move out of their houses because of the risk of stormwater pond failures. So it was quite the fiasco. Um, I would suggest this could have been broken up into much smaller chunks and they would have had 
uh, houses built and possibly people living in some of them. So for example, um, if you did 20 acres and you were able to start in May, April, May, um, I think you could eat pretty easily follow a schedule like this and have uh, building or actually building houses and such through fall and winter. Uh, another another thing to keep in mind is divert. So divert as much water away from your project as you can. This is a small project, of course, but berms, ditches, things like that to keep clean water away from your project so it doesn't get dirty. Once it gets dirty, you have to manage it. Uh, contain the site water. So assuming site water is going to be dirty, you want to contain it. In this case, asphalt burns, sill fences, things like that. And then pumping. Uh, in this case, they're pumping dirty water to a treatment system. So discharge options. If there's not too much water, it's not too dirty, uh, you possibly can infiltrate. You could spread it out on vegetation. Um, or look into your local sewer agency uh, if you have a reasonable access to a sewer line. Uh, you may be able to discharge. Uh, in King County, it's a permit process and they do limit uh, quantity and quality, but it is, it is a useful option in many projects. Another option is to pump into trucks and, and haul offsite for some kind of disposal, uh, which is slow and expensive, so it's not always the best option. Small amounts of water or very contaminated water uh, with, uh, with chemicals, and certainly that's a good option. And then too, too much water, too dirty, and or, and or a high risk project, um, you're going to have to do active uh, chemical treatment or electrocoagulation treatment. So disposal options, these are several of the possibilities and uh, prevention, while it's not a disposal option, it does keep you from having to dispose uh, potentially. So I'm going to go through each of these in more detail. And by the way, I'm going to go through the first slides here fairly quickly and try to spend a lot more time on project examples. So prevention, for example, um, keep asphalt as long as possible. This road did eventually go out, but it was used as a haul road. Trucks stayed on it, and, and uh, they were loaded out. This actually points out another issue related to wet weather construction, and that's sediment track out on roads, which then creates water quality issues. So with the prevention, keep surfaces clean, uh, hand sweeping, vector sw vacuum sweeping, things like that. So both are uh, important things to keep in mind. So on wet weather projects, um, I always say, OK, we're almost certainly going to need a treatment system. And we're almost certainly going to need a tire wash. And you know, I work with the designers and tell them that. So just plan on including that. And you know, if we can change it later, we will. But it's kind of a given. I uh, just want to mention settling and filtration. Very limited uh, for, uh, for use in reducing turbidity. Be again, because turbidity is caused primarily by colloidal, very small particles. Uh, and you don't have the time to settle it. So, and especially if you're dealing with a lot of water, uh, it's, it just doesn't work. So I wouldn't rely on it in itself uh, in most cases. So here's the sanitary sewer, sewer as a possible discharge location. Uh, I'll talk about active treatment. So the primary method these days is Kytosan enhanced sand filtration. Uh, there's also electrocoagulation systems that are very effective. Um, we've used both at the port. Now, in the state of Washington, you can't use passive treatment. It has to be active treatment. So depending on your jurisdiction, you may or may not be able to do that, and I'll give some examples. And just as a fun brief aside, uh, the Port of Seattle has, has treated, actively treated, probably more approaching a billion gallons of construction stormwater and uh, discharging to the surrounding creeks at the airport. So it's been uh, very useful for the Port of Seattle. So this is this just shows the tanks, but um, this is part of a kind of sand enhanced sand filtration. Maybe a similar setup, setup with um, electrocoagulation. There'll be a control box uh, in a probably a trailer uh, off to the side of this picture, not, not in the honey bucket there. Um, so computer controlled with uh, testing and um, lots of monitoring systems. 
And then, so some, this is a trailer mounted for, uh, I don't know if they actually use this for construction, but uh, maybe just for showing people. Uh, this is an electrocoagulation, same sand filter configuration as uh, the Kaida sand system. They just use electricity rather than chemicals to add a generally, uh, I think a positive charge to the water to uh, cause the colloidal particles, which are generally negatively charged to glom on together and drop out through gravity settling. Here's my little home example, my little science experience, uh, experiment, nine volt battery and aluminum strips. And this is, I don't know, it's maybe an hour. Uh, so it, it actually does work, it's pretty cool. Okay, and very quickly, so I'm not an engineer. Uh, I just play one at work and played one at work, but um, generally with treatment and you're, you know, when you're trying to figure out what kind of, or how big a system, how much storage volume you're gonna have to do. So if you go back to what I was saying earlier, uh, one and a third tanks per inch of rain per acre, um, it's, that's a lot of, it's gonna end up being a lot of storage if you had to collect it all, but that's offset by the fact that you're treating and discharging. So that's, that's really all I'm saying on this slide is um, you figure out how much rainfall you're gonna have in, in uh, Washington for treatment system, you have, to, you have to be able to store one and a half times a 10 year, 24 hour storm event, which is three inches. But again, that volume is offset by the fact that you're treating it and discharging it at probably you know, anywhere from, I think the smallest system we've used is 400 gallons per minute. Uh, the biggest uh, that I recall is 3000 gallons a minute system. So in that, that system, I'll, I'll talk about in the project later, uh, still required a million and a half gallon storage volume. Okay, there's also, I mentioned the passive treatment, there's chitosan acetate and polyacrylamide are the two main options. And um, with chitosan, it's chitosan material, chitosan acetate sewn into geotextile bags and they're placed in a water flow, water stream. Uh, for passive dosing. And then polyacrylamide, this is one of the main ones, a company back east makes the flock logs. So it's a polyacrylamide uh, um, formed into logs also placed into a water flow. So here's the tanker situation I mentioned earlier for disposal. Uh, I don't know why we did this. That was just a terrible, very slow process. Okay. Um, Oh, sorry. Sorry about that, Joe. I didn't see up there. Okay, so again, we only have a few participants here. So if you guys have questions, go ahead and unmute. And uh, before I get into projects, fire away. Okay, no questions. And by the way, I don't know if you recognize the song uh, that's on the first slide there, uh, Stormy Weather, classic song written in 1933, I think, um, and sung by Lena Horne in the movie of 1943, Stormy Weather. So great classic song. Okay, now I'm just going to go through a bunch of random projects, uh, not in any particular order. I'll get through as many as I can. Uh, this was a project the port did in 1997 that failed very quickly, unfortunately. It was uh, just before I started there. Uh, so it's not, it wasn't my fault. Um, I think it was 40 acres, about 400,000 cubic yards of fill to create this parking lot. Um, one of the things that's critical if you're gonna be doing wet weather work is your erosion plan has to be functional. And this was the erosion plan for the, uh, part of the, this project. Um, and you probably can't see the detail that much, but basically everything in this is a sediment control BMP. So silt fence, which is fine, ditches with check dams, which is fine, but the main treatment for this site is a pond, temporary pond designed for the two year, 24 hour event, which is two inches. Is there a question? Okay. Um, so it's all sediment control. You're not going to settle out enough material in that pond to uh, to help you out. So and and also if you look at this, you have to fill almost 90 feet to be able to install this pond. Uh, 
uh, this temporary pond. So this is a completely non-functional erosion plan. Uh, if we were to do this now, it would definitely be a Kaida sand enhanced sand filtration or electrocoagulation. We'd figure out how to get the water to it and uh, where to discharge it. So, and this is, uh, so this was the part of the fill. The pond would be at the top of this. And this is what happened after, they weren't even large events. There was a series of, I think, six month events. Uh, no, even smaller actually. Six month is a is one inch in Seattle. So a series of very small events created this uh, and filled a wetland. Um, another, in addition to the erosion plan design, the specs are extremely critical. This was one of the main specs for the project. Um, and telling a contractor to phase clearing and grading activity to expose the least area of soil for the shortest possible time. First of all, this is completely uh, unenforceable and completely unbiddable. And the, it's just, uh, you know, it's unbelievable to me that this was put in a contract. Uh, especially one that went in the wet weather. weather so, um, okay. So somebody uh, could somebody uh, mute their their speaker. There's a lot of uh, background noise. Here. Thank you. Okay, uh, this was a small project. This was just ex extending an asphalt area to provide uh, better parking access for uh, some trucks. Uh, it was tributary to a very small tr creek. Uh, and the reason I show this, and this is, I couldn't find the other pictures, but basically, so this is the area to the left of the existing asphalt. Um, and it was ended up being done in, in the winter, actually. So fortunately, the contractor who was very amenable to working with me, um, I said, okay, you got two issues here, two main issues, turbid water going into catch basins to the right um, outside the picture. Um, and track out. So I just, I worked with them and we came up with some alternatives and stuff. They said, yeah, we can keep equipment. Uh, we can load out dump trucks on the asphalt. We'll keep our site equipment on site. They're, they never had track out. And then as far as managing water, um, they agreed to just put in a simple French drain along the edge of the asphalt. They cut down, a, a, you know, below the existing. Everything drained toward uh toward the toward where i was taking the picture and then this rock area um there's a little plate here they actually set up a little pump um, and piping this whole area was surrounded by landscape area which was grass so they were able to pump uh turbid water into the grass through a perforated pipe so again very small but a lot of thought went into to doing this and uh you know you can contractors they don't want to have trouble so you know you can usually work with them uh, to come up with solutions like this. Nothing was in the erosion plan related. All they had was silt fence, which wasn't turned out not to be needed. Silt fence and catch basin inserts. So think about the water. Uh, another small project, same, same creek uh, done in winter. So you can imagine the amount of water coming off the asphalt draining over to the ditch line. Uh, so we were able to bypass all of the runoff from the entrance freeway away from the work area or, or past the work area and install the silt fence also to do the same thing. So anything that ran off that slope ended up, I'm gonna turn around and face the other way. Oops, that didn't work. Um, so turning around, so where the light pole is, is property, we can't go beyond that. So we just set up a little sump area uh, pump on floats and then pumped into vegetation at the top of the slope. So you see the silt fence that ran to the left uh, back up the ditch line. So any dirty water would have been contained. So that worked really well. Another, uh, maybe a medium sized project, we relocated a taxiway. Uh, this was one of those operational things that FAA said you can't do it in the summer. So it was moving, um, I think from, was it to the left or the right? Anyway, so we had to relocate a taxiway. And no sill fence or anything like that. It was all about moving water around. Um, we didn't have to treat water. We just kept as much clean water out of the site as possible using uh, berms. And then uh, clean water was pumped around the site. Uh, 
this catch basin in the site is completely plugged. And then uh, as or not asphalt, uh, compost berms uh, surrounding areas of the work area. And then the water was, uh, it wasn't always clean, unfortunately. So we pumped into a geotextile bag in a vegetated area that then drained to uh, catch basin surrounded with a sock and um, catch basin insert in the grate. So that worked really well. This is a fun one. If you've seen any of my presentations, you've probably seen this before. Um, this was a three phase project to build a, a concrete tilt up building. This is the original erosion plan as designed. And we got the plan at hundred, pretty much 100% and this had to get on the street. So this is how it went out on the street. And again, look at, look at the pond um, and think about turbidity. This is a completely non-functional overwinter uh, erosion plan. Um, and this, had to, this was overwinter. The phase one um, was summer work. Uh, and actually we combined part of phase two with phase one. We did the grading and put gravel down, we didn't pave. But we had to also, um, as part of phase two, we had to build a preload. So that's, uh, I, don't know, I, can't, I don't know, can't really tell here. So here's the preload covered with plastic because of this, the nature of the soil, we had to compact the heck out of it. So uh, covered with plastic, placed the gravel base down. So all the water ran to the low spot here uh, in the parking area and then was pumped over into a grassy area. So we met, this is how we managed the site water all winter. And then in the spring, we were able to uh, work the site and uh, kept this in place, but we were able to build the building. And then once that was done, we were able to tear down the old building. So this was all completely surrounded by asphalt. And fortunately, all the storm went to one manhole uh, because it was concrete, there was going to be a pH issue. So we set up a treatment system for pH. We plugged the outlet of that manhole, used it as a sump, uh, pumped water. We had two tanks based on the uh, amount of water we figured we were going to have to deal with, used dry ice, and then pumped into a different manhole for discharge. So um, the whole thing was designed around the idea that this is the water is not going to discharge without going through this treatment system. A larger project, this was five, six years ago. Uh, this was completely rebuilding the center runway at SeaTac Airport. It's over a 400 acre project. Uh, oh, wait a minute, no, sorry, wrong one. This is uh, what we called the third runway. So yeah, over 400 acres. So this is the construction area you can see uh, top center the two uh, older runways uh, near this bottom center. And this is what some of the early construction look, looked like. Now, we, this whole thing was designed, same idea, same philosophy. All water is going to be collected, diverted, pumped to um, future stormwater ponds that we constructed early. But they were blinded off, so all of the water, uh, nothing could discharge. Everything went through a Kaidosan enhanced sand filtration system before discharge. The airport is completely surrounded by uh, by creeks. There's Miller Creek is to the right here. Um, also, you do see silt fence in the trees, kind of the top right center, and you see a grassy berm. That was another part of the philosophy was everything that we could get uh, hydro seeded and growing, uh, we did. So we pretty much had the entire project surrounded with some type of berm system with the outside slopes grassed. Silt fence was almost redundant at that point. But here you see uh, there's dirt berms at the top of slopes. Uh, there's a dirt berm around the top of the stockpile to the right. And there's uh, ditches and berms on the slope uh, above center that's angled to the right, diverting water off that slope down into a ditch system where it's then uh, collected and pumped. So that was our philosophy on this project uh, was, again, all the water collected, treated, um, and to get everything vegetated as soon as possible. So this, this was over, I think, three winters or four winters we worked this project. So that's the third runway there, top center with a bunch of new taxiways. 
And you can see the ponds, there's four ponds visible just uh, up screen from the third runway. Those were, again, were built first and then we used them to contain water. Uh, we had a total of, let's see, four or five, probably six, seven, seven or eight ponds that we ended up uh, using for construction stormwater. Okay, here we go, the center runway construction. I'm gonna go over, uh, you guys, if you can stay, that would be awesome. Uh, but again, this will be recorded. So uh, if you need to leave, go ahead and I'll be sad, but that's okay. So uh, center construction, center runway construction, complete rebuild, tore out the old one and, and uh, rebuilt a new one. So over 200 acres, philosophy again, all water was to be collected and treated for discharge. And then we had to get grass growing. So this actually started out as summer work. Uh, we didn't intend to go into the wet season and for various reasons we had to. Uh, and we had to upgrade the treatment system from a 2000 GPM to a 3000 GPM. The uh, reddish area in the center, that's the primary drainage for the center runway. Um, we had two main drainage areas, the red to the left. So most of it was going to the left and then the uh, green and pink areas were going to the right. Um, and what we're able to do, you know, based on the, the philosophy that we had is by adding a couple manholes and um, making, making some tweak or tweaking the existing storm system, we were able to bypass uh, some clean water from an area that would have gone into this uh, stormwater vault that's in yellow, bypass it to a different vault. And then all of the dirty water from probably three quarters of the site ended up going into the stormwater vault, uh, which we then pumped into Kaida sand and Hanton sand filtration in the blue area, and then pumped the clean water back out into the same system that that offsite uh, water was taken to. So, um, so any any time you can on a, on a uh, multi-year project, you know, if, if you can use modify existing storm to move water around to get it where you want to go, it's something to consider and design. So in that project, we treated over 25 million gallons. Uh, another project, North Star Terminal, surrounded by asphalt, but we had to extend the existing old terminal into the yellow area. Uh, so you had to pull up asphalt, had to dig a big hole to put in the new basement area. So here's the start of that. Uh, so philosophy is keep all of the clean water out and contain all of the dirty water in. Uh, designer figured that a 400 GPM treatment system uh, would handle the water in the area uh, that we were working. So we had that and that's was pretty much that was pretty much it. Um, they didn't have to use a tire wash because they, ma they uh, maintained the loadout of, of vehicles um, on asphalt and such. So, and there it is today. There's actually, they're extending it to the lower right. But let's see the new jetways. Terminal five reconstruction, uh, seaport project. Uh, this is going on right now. So this, this phase, uh, which is done, but this phase was 15 acres of absolute and total destruction. Um, but it's essentially a flat area, flat paved parking lot. That's what a container terminal is. So you can either manage a lot of dirty water uh, from the asphalt, or you can try to maintain it. So you've got as much clean water as possible to deal with on this project. Uh, we used a combination of a treatment system, but also infiltration for localized areas. So catch basins were covered with 30 mil polyvinyl chloride plastic, so nothing could get in them. And then uh, asphalt was removed near the catch basins or in the drainage ways, filled with rocks so people could drive over them. Uh, but the asphalt was removed to the subgrade and water that would uh, end up there, you know, wouldn't drain right away, of course. It, take overnight or a couple days, but it would uh, disappear and easy. We didn't have to do anything. So here's another area that we uh, used uh, infiltration. And yet another area we needed an emergency stockpile area. So got approval to cut out asphalt trenches. And here is during a rainstorm. Um, 
in general with infiltration, you don't want much dirty water going in because you're going to plug and plug up your infiltration capability. Uh, but this one, this one actually worked out pretty well. Here's a, a fun little uh, project. This was making a storm or sewer, probably a sewer connection for an upcoming project. And they used asphalt berms to contain the water within the site that they pumped uh, back into the project area. That's the sandbagged area to the right. And then roadway water coming down the, the hill to the left was diverted into a catch basin. So water was kept separate. <laughs> And they were able to, to work through wet. It doesn't look wet here, but they, they could. Um, I'm going to skip this one because I only have the one slide. So this is a, an ongoing project. This was winter work. So small, small area habitat restoration. Uh, turbidity curtain to contain um, any turbid runoff and then cover slopes as quickly and as much as possible as you're, uh, when you're done for the day. So this was a private project I worked on on my uh, as side side work. So this was a housing development. It's that triangle area to the right, and this is in the city of Redmond, Washington, which has very stringent stormwater requirements. They require a wet weather plan if you're going to work between October first and uh, March thirty first, and it's a very extensive plan. I found out pretty quickly. So again, here's the area 104th, 156th, 157th, 102nd, it's that area. But you see the topo, everything is draining down a fairly steep slope um, into a creek. So uh, first thing, I, I know I keep saying this, but if you wanna work, in my opinion, if you wanna work a project like this over winter, it's you've gotta collect the water and chemically treat it. There's just no way to use conventional BMPs and meet water quality. So, so here's uh, what it looked like. Fortunately, Google Earth nailed the timing on this. So you can see it's a stormwater pond. The box to the left of the stormwater pond is the small Kaida sand enhanced sand filtration system. We're able to utilize the existing storm system, uh, both to divert clean water away, but then also to contain site water. Uh, and this is what that plan look like. Uh, so CESF is the treatment system, uh, figured out where we could discharge, um, which manholes we had to expand, had to take two lots uh, to use as a temporary stormwater pond to contain the volume. Unfortunately, the contractor didn't build it this way. They just used the smaller area, which was going to be the final stormwater vault area. Uh, and they actually overflowed. Uh, I was long gone by then. I just did the plan. So uh, you can't blame me for that either. You can blame me for a lot of things, but not that one. So that's what that looked like. So if you're in a jurisdiction like that, um, I found that they really like it if you're going to offer a treatment system. Okay, I've gone over. Um, I won't go through these. Uh, you can. Uh, review them on the video that I'll post on our YouTube channel. But I'm also going to PDF the presentation and I'll post it with a link on uh, Google Docs site. So you can go through these. These are just some of the things to keep in mind for wet weather work. Um, it's all of, well, all of these things. I, I, don't, I don't know what to add to these. I, I, well, I will add tire wash, I, that's a, that would be a separate presentation, but if you're gonna do a, a big earth job in this in the winter time, you really have to have a tire wash system. Um, again, my, my background is Port of Seattle. We have a very low risk tolerance because the airport is surrounded by people, houses. Um, so maybe your risk is much lower and, and some track out is okay, track out it. Uh, on poor projects is not okay ever. So um, we just assume you're going to have to use a tire wash. So I definitely consider it. Okay, with that, um, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, anybody have any questions? Oh, that is a great question from Jacqueline. Why not put permit, permit language? 
you you clearly haven't seen my other presentation. Actually, I'm going to redo it. I've done it a few times. Um, briefly, the reason you can't put permit language directly in a contract is because permits use language like minimize and when practicable, um, or you may, or you should, or things like that, none of which are, yeah, very good. Thanks, Rob. Roll up your windows before exiting tire wash. Uh, permit language is serves a different purpose. Now, you can put a permit in a contract as is and reference it in the specs, but you really have to rewrite, you, you have to figure out what in the permit specifically applies to the contractor. And then you have to write a spec to, to address that is the, the best way to get compliance. So again, so for example, I'll give you the, I'll, I'll give you my presentation, my other presentation in 30 seconds. Um, there's language in the construction stormwater general permit for Washington that says, to essentially minimize track out using rock uh, entrances. Well, on a small project in the summer, that may work. It will not work in the winter. Um, so first of all, minimize is a subjective word. So my minimize is gonna be different from yours and, and the regulators. Um, my, my minimize on port projects was, I don't wanna see it. And that was written into the contract, it was, uh, you shall not have visible uh, sediment track out from the project at any time. So that's how that's how the port handled it. But permit language is it's just weak language for a construction contract in general. So, uh, but stay tuned. I do plan on doing a longer presentation on that uh, in the future. So, any other questions? That's pretty awesome, Rob. I, I love that. I've been. I've forgotten to roll up my uh, windows many times from tire washes. You're welcome, Jacqueline. Um, thank you all very much. Again, uh, so go to our website for uh, to know where everything is going to be and for future uh, presentations. Also, the LinkedIn site, if you came in through LinkedIn, uh, we'll be posting more. Plan another one in two weeks. Uh, the subject to be determined. So. Thank you all very much. Appreciate uh, you attending and uh, hope you have a good day.